Los Angeles, California, we present the program of the Voice of Prophecy, a voice crying in the wilderness of these latter days, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now we invite you to listen to our broadcast and share with us the mutual blessing and inspiration of this hour together. We are bound for Canaan land, standing by the way. Who shall lead us on the road? Choose your king today. Dare to stand. Like Joshua, dare to save the world. As for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. Just before us, Jordan rolls right across the way. Safely trust the Lord, He shall lead today. Dare to stand like Joshua, dare to say the word. As for me and for my heart, we will serve the Lord. Almighty and most gracious Heavenly Father, from the beginning of the world, thou hast purposed that the earth may be filled with happy homes. This purpose cannot fail. Thou hast said the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, that thy blessing may be in our homes today to upbuild the moral and national order and make these homes a foretaste of that eternal home where there shall be fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee. Near to the heart of God. From the voice of prophecy to all of you listening in out there in Radio Land, we send our greetings, especially to those listening today for the first time over news stations. Your radio broadcasters have only recently completed a public appearance tour of Missouri and Kansas, and what great states they are. Everywhere the people were friendly and voice of prophecy minded. Now we are back home again in Los Angeles, and we cannot help but think of the words of the old melody, home sweet home, mid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Mid pleasures and palaces, although we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. A charm from the sky seems to 
And now, the voice of prophecy. Our subject is home, sweet home. While the radio is on, we listen to reports of battles and victories overseas. There's one battle we may not forget, only at our peril. The battle against crime, especially juvenile delinquency. According to J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, as reported in the congressional record, nearly 1,500,000 crimes were committed in the United States in one year. In addition to these crimes, there were 16 million minor offenses in the same year. Mr. Hoover says we know from actual case studies that persons under 21 years of age account for 13% of all murderers arrested, 40% of all robbers, 56% of all burglars, 65% of all car thieves, 27% of forgers, 29% of arsonists, and 87% of all thieves arrested. Can we hear such disturbing facts from a man in Mr. Hoover's position without a sense of deep concern? The Signs of the Times, America's Great Prophetic Weekly, carries a statement by Captain John J. Cronin, head of the Missing Persons Bureau of New York City, that 3,248 girls and 3,118 boys between 13 and 20 years of age were reported missing in 43, with 41% increase in missing girls over the previous year. He says war conditions, infatuation with servicemen, misplaced patriotism, parents working unable to take care of the children, girls especially, were the chief reason for this increase. These things do not just happen. The Bible says, the curse caused less shall not come, Proverbs 26, 2. And besides the excitement of war times, there are other definite causes for our rising wave of boy and girl crime. Mr. Hoover says people commit crimes because they lack moral responsibility, because their spiritual growth has been stifled. We have youth committing crime because we fail to provide youth with a proper upbringing. Children are driven to crime because of deep-laid faults in society, such as poverty, degeneracy, parental neglect, and lack of religious training. What can we expect, my friends, when over 60 million of our fellow citizens profess no religion whatever? And many of these do not even believe in God. If parents believe in no divine governor of the universe, no moral standard in the Ten Commandments, no judgment to come, how can they lead young minds to regard any rules of righteous social behavior? If, according to a God-ignoring popular philosophy, men are only partially educated animals, with no heaven to win, no hell to shun, how can morality exist? Is it any wonder that a generation which is increasingly influenced by Christian living in the home, uh, that is, Christless living in the home, rather, is causing grave concern to the law-enforcing agencies of our country? The home is the final bulwark of the nation. The hand that rocks the cradle is still the hand that guides the country for good or ill. And it's sad to say, my friend, that today it can clearly be seen that the hand that rocks the cradle is rocking the boat of our national life and rocking it dangerously. The largest responsibility for juvenile delinquency rests upon parents, without a doubt. Schools and churches can't take the place of fathers and mothers and homes. If the home is, so the young people will be, nine times out of ten. If father and mother forget God, results will be seen in the children. A great revival of prayer and Bible reading in a million homes now that do more good than the most tireless efforts of all the police. A home where day by day the word of God is read and the voice of prayer ascends like a morning and evening sacrifice where father and mother love each other and love the children. That's a fortress for good living and right citizenship. The cause of increasing lawlessness among the young is set forth in scriptural words here, words of terrible power in Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. As we've increased in wealth and power, we have not increased in righteous living. Even some religious circles have been popular to look upon the Bible as less than the Word of God. And children have not been immune from modernistic doubts, even in their Bible classes. As reported in the Review and Herald, the official organ of the Seventh-day Adventists, we read that here of a teacher who was telling her class of the time when the Lord said the multitude, you remember, with five loaves and two fishes. He said that, of course, children, 
We understand it doesn't mean that Jesus actually fed all those thousands with a few loaves and fishes. Oh, that would have been impossible. It just means that he so fed the people with his teaching that they lost all sense of hunger, not home satisfied. The little girl spoke up and said, But, Miss So-and-so, what was it that filled the twelve baskets of fragments that were left over? Yes, what did indeed? This poor woman's skepticism had gone too far. Even a child could see through it. My appeal today is to teachers, not only to boys and girls, to teachers and to parents, and those in authority over children, as well as to the young people, that if you have a real home, appreciate it, but most especially, parents, determine with God's help to have a home that God can bless and honor with his presence. You can change your whole abode from mere private hotel to home and sweet home. So wherever the children go, they look back to the home with fond memories. Father and mother, it's up to you. You can't evade or sidestep or get around the responsibility placed upon you by God. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. This doesn't mean harsh words or cruelty either. It does mean we're to live right and talk right before our children and love them and do our very best to lead them, not drive them. Is the path of an honest, god fearing man. As Edgar Guest said, it takes a lot of living in a house to make it home. The right kind of living, too. Your home may be complete in every particular except one. The one thing needful may be lacking. The presence of Christ may not be there. It is when Jesus has a place in the home that it becomes a little heaven, right here on earth, to go to heaven Eden. You know the child's to be pitied whose parents have tongues like machine guns. Harsh words and tones get on the nerves and into the heart of a child. He absorbs his environment. He becomes like it at last. One little boy said, I wish I could mind my mother and father like my dog minds me. He always looks so pleased to mind. I don't. Well, friends, we all fail in obedience. Fathers and mothers can be partners with God in the home. He knows all about their problems. Let us consider just a few minutes some of the methods God uses in dealing with his children. First, he requires strict obedience, Jeremiah 7, 23. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, and it may be well with you. Second, he gives tests and commands, as in Eden. He said, You may do this, and you must not do that, you remember. And thirdly, after telling his children what to do, God puts the responsibility of choice upon them. When they develop to the place where they know right from wrong and can choose to obey or disobey, he says, Come now, let us reason together. Isaiah 1.18. Then he explains why the right way is best for everybody. Fourth, he promises a reward for obedience and punishment for disobedience. Isaiah 1.19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with a sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Five, and he makes everything so plain that we can understand his requirements and the results of doing right and of doing wrong. And sixth, God always keeps his word. That's something to remember for, with in dealing out with our children. He doesn't threaten a spanking and then forget all about it. With God, the harvest always follows the planting, whether it's a good harvest or a bad one. It always comes just as the planting was. As we sow, we reap. God does what he says, always. And then, seventh, God does not require impossible things. What he tells us to do, he enables us to do. He knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. We're his children. In dealing with us, he considers the nature of a child and watches over it with sympathizing care. Eight, when we are disobedient, God doesn't accept excuses. Remember the experience of Saul and God gave him a command which he didn't obey? Then Saul sort of tried to excuse himself by saying he had changed God's way because he wanted to give God a gift. The Lord said to obey is better than sacrifice. And nine, God loves his children too much to withhold correction when they need it. As we read in Hebrews 12, 6, For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. He suffers with his children. The only reason that he corrects them is that they may repent and choose right. Paul speaks of that, you remember, over in Hebrews 12, where he says, We had our earthly fathers who corrected us. How much more shall God correct those he loves? And while we must have obedience in a real home, 
It's no place for harshness or cruelty. Provoke not your children to wrath, we're told by the apostle in Ephesians 6, 4, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In all God's merciful dealings with us, we can learn lessons that will help us in training our children in building a true home, a home that will be a strength to the nation, a blessing to the world. Happy the home when God is there, and love fills every breast, when one their wish and one their prayer, and one their heavenly rest. Happy the home where Jesus' name is sweet to every year, when children early lisp his fame and parents hold him dear. The story of how one father dealt with his boy who was slipping a little may help us some. A minister living in New England had a son about 14 years old. One afternoon, the teacher of school came to the house and asked the father, Is Philip sick? No, why? He wasn't at school today. Is that so? He wasn't there yesterday. You don't mean it. Nor the day before that. Is that possible? So I thought he might be sick. No, he's not sick. Well, I thought you should know about it. So the teacher went away, and soon the father heard the gate click. He went to open the door, and when the boy saw him, he realized that his father knew about those three days. The father said, Come into the room, Phil. They both went in. The door was shut, and the father said, Phil... Your teacher was here and said you were not at school today, or yesterday, and the day before. We supposed you were. You let us think so. You don't know how bad I feel. I've always said I can trust Phil. And here you've been living a lie for three days. Hard to be talked to quietly that way. It would have been much easier to take a whipping. Then the father said, Phil, we're going to pray. And they got down on their knees, and the father prayed for his boy. Phil listened and knew how bad his father felt. When they got up, there were tears in their eyes, and the father said, Phil, it's a law of life that where there's sin, there's suffering. Where there's suffering, there's sin somewhere. You can't separate the two. You've done wrong. I'm in this house as God is in the world, so we'll do this. You go up to the attic. I'll make a bed for you up there and bring your meals to you, and you'll stay up there just as long as you've been living a lie, three days and three nights. Phil didn't say a word. They went up to the attic, and the father prepared a bed for him and kissed him and left him alone. Then supper time came. Neither father nor mother could eat. They went into the living room and tried to read, but the words ran together. Finally went to bed, but neither could sleep. After midnight, the father said, I can't stand it any longer. I'm going upstairs with Phil. So he took his pillow and went up quietly so as not to waken the boy. Tiptoed across the floor to the corner by the window. There Phil lay wide awake with something glistening in his eyes and stains on his cheek. Father got bed with the boy, and soon their arms around each other's necks. Always been great pals. Their tears got all mixed up together, and then they both fell asleep. Next night, the father said, Good night, Mother. I'm going upstairs with Phil. Again the third night, he slept in the place of punishment with his son. Oh, radio friends, if our homes are to be a home sweet home, we shall need obedience and love and Lots of love. Nothing but loving hearts can make a true home, and in such homes all the hope of our country lies today. It's the Father's kingdom, the Mother's world, the children's paradise. May God help us to make our homes what they ought to be and what they may be, a place where God dwells, where Christ is honored. Our home life here is to prepare us for a place in the home over there where the Heavenly Father will welcome His children of earth to love, rest, and home sweet home. As the song says, the dwellers in the homeland are beckoning me to come where neither death nor sorrow invades their holy home. Oh, dear, dear native country, oh, rest and peace above. Christ, bring us all to the homeland of thy redeeming love. The homeland, oh, the homeland, the land of the free born. There's no night in the homeland, but hey, the faithless morn. Oh.
faith in God, whatever men may say, have faith in God, for that's the better way. Have faith, dear friend, in God. his face shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace.